Hello everyone, what's up? So today's video has just posted up the um, mature male and female peak average I'm mating. So on the next list is the tarantula mythbuster video that I promised I would make a couple of days. So today I'm going to be making it. So this one here is 18. And oh, oh my god, I just forgot. Uh, it's Sonic's last day of uh, in my collection, so why not I do a Mythbuster video on the P Metallica, so that way it'll be a great video to uh, set him off. Okay, so as you stated, or I stated before, this is going to be a Pompidius Mythbuster video. So it's going to cover um, mainly all the Pompidius species. Over here, I only have uh, two of them. The two tanks right over here are both uh, P. platyama, male and female, so you will have a difference to know what they look like between the sexes. They're strikingly very different. And the one over here is my uh, P. antinus. So it's going to cover uh, the Fortis, the species Malshala, species Ecuador, Nigricolor, uh, Bolivia, Peru, Insignis, Ornatus, and the rare and elusive Ultra Marinus. Okay, so let's get started. So, the P. platyama is commonly called the Pink Bloom Bird Eater. As you know, you probably have seen my mature male and many, no, my immature male, it's not mature yet. In many of my feeding videos, he actually has a pink color to his femur and all his legs. We'll see it soon enough and the Bolivian Steely Blue Lake because of the mature male has a sort of like a blue tinge to them on the legs. So the females of the species for the pink bloom are a brown color to them and for the Pamphibedius uh, Antinus, the Steely Blue Lake has more of a black color to them. So they kind of resemble like a big beefed up version of uh, Gramasola pulchra. Okay, so here are the Latin names as I described, Pamphibedius species platyama. So now, if you check sometimes on older web pages or sometimes in stock lists, uh, you'll see a platyama name under this one, Vitalius. That's just an old name. Uh, it's Vitalius platyama is the same thing as the Pamphibedius platyama. I think why they describe the we put them in this genus because of the sling. If you have seen Pompidia species before, uh, they are famously known for their Christmas tree patterns on the abdomen. It does not happen in uh, the. Let's see which ones were, were they? The Ultra Marinus and the P. Antinus. That's the only species that do not have the Christmas tree patterns as slings on their abdomens. Okay, so pronunciation of this uh, Latin name, it's kind of pretty easy to figure out. Pamphobetius, Platyoma, and Antinus. And slangs, people like to call them the Pamphos. I think it's pretty easy to figure out. Okay, so the cost and availability. Well, availability, you'll find them most likely in online dealers. They're never actually ever found in pet stores, at least not to my knowledge. So a cost for the specimens, well they kind to tend to range very much. Um, I guess I'll show you what Tarantula has on their price list that they have. So we'll be able to get a good idea how much they cost in Canada. Okay, so we have Fortis as a 4 inch female going for $125, which is pretty typical. Uh, the Antinus it's around 50 and that's it and yeah this is the rarest one the ultra marinus valued at $350 this is by far the most expensive pomphibedius on the market and with good reason it's actually really beautiful now I'm really not that keen on spending 350 bucks for that sling but um, Maybe if I get some money, in, that would be good. Okay, so the P. platyama, uh, the ones I paid for, 
Uh, my mature female, I paid $150. Then again, this is, was from Arachnoboards, and it was from Segman for Life that uh, needed to sell his collection, so I got a great deal on this one. Uh, the P. Platyama, I bought this one in 2008. I paid for her around $50 which was a one and a half inch uh, spiderling or ju juvenile. Uh, the Christmas patterns were visible on the species but not much because they had a lot of hair on them. And this Antinous female, I got this one for a hundred dollars as an eight inch. So uh, that was good. That was from the Colo 85 or the Arachnoboards. Okay, so now the relative sizes of Pamphibedia species. Well, Pamphibedia species are kind of on the largest side. Uh, they generally have a leg span between six to nine inches in dam in leg span. Uh, the biggest one ever recorded, but I really can't speak from experience because I never actually see one, nor do I know if they really exist in the hobby, is so called the chicken eating spider, which is a Pompidia species that is reportedly to have a thirteen to fourteen inch leg span. So I really don't know if it's true, it's uh, online rumors that uh, this is so. Uh, their curb weight of the species is 4 ounces. So it's uh, pretty much on the ball with a uh, T. blondie size. A T. blondie size is about a quarter pound. And uh, yeah, so now about their typical colors of the Panthamedia species. Well, as you say, saw me say before, usually that the females are actually the prettiest and the males aren't. Well, in the case of Pamphibedia species, it is the opposite. The males are actually quite strikingly colored than the females. For example, the pink bloom bird eater, as you'll see soon for my mature female, uh, she is very brown colored and not really that much pleasant to look at, but no, she's really big. But the pink bloom bird eater males have an iridescent pink all over their body, which you'll soon see. As in the case for the Bolivian Sealy Blue Lake, uh, the female Antinous will look exactly like a G. pulchra. It is an all black species, except for mature males that have a blue tinge to them on their femurs and their patella. So this is probably why they call it the Bolivian Steely Blue Leg, just because of the mature males. Okay, so the growth rates, uh, I would consider them on the medium fast side. They're not as like big, like uh, fast growth rates compared to peak insertes. But my mature, well, my immature male uh, Platyama that I got in 2008 was an inch and a half. He grew around four inches in about three years. So that's pretty typical of them. Um, yeah. So probably within five to seven years you'll probably get a mature specimen. So the longevity, their lifespan is pretty typical of the bird eaters like the Lassidora species where they'll have a 12 to 15 year lifespan for females and for males they'll have uh, maybe 5 to 6. Ma mature males probably will live about a year after they mature. Okay so now they're enclosure setups. Well as you may have seen from where to buy my tea enclosures um, for slings I recommend putting them in pill jars like this and then upgrading it to those deli containers, that's what I used to have, my P. Antinous, the old one that I had that passed away, and my P. Paniyama, then I upgraded them to Critter Keepers, like the ones you see right here. Uh, this one here is from Crabworks, houses my immature male well, and I had the larger variety from Hagen, the Fanarium type. As you can see, it's much more larger and it's perfect for the 9 inch uh, T. But I actually might have to re I might want to rehouse her in my old 5 gallon tank that was left by my uh, H. Von Worthy so that way uh, when my mature male well my, when my male does mature out I'm going to 
put her in that tank and hopefully get her more room so I can actually mate in there. Okay, now for the care sheet of the species. Temperature, I recommend putting them uh, around uh, 80 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. You could just drop it down to 77 at night. So pretty typical, like I said, I use the heater to warm up the room and uh, humidifier to provide humidity in the room. Uh, humidity, you have to keep these around 80%. Uh, you really can't let it get too bone dry of the substrate, especially for slings that that way they'll desiccate uh, readily, I mean dehydrate. Alright, so without further ado, let's go have a look at the specimens to show you what they actually look like for mine. Okay, so here's my P. Antonis. Uh, she is in a 6 liter shoebox enclosure. She is an 8 inch female. Um, as you can see, the colors are not looking the greatest. Uh, she has a brown color, but if you check her abdomen, she's in serious need of a pre -molt. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can get an idea to see what she actually looks like when she molts. So you see a 6 liter shoebox enclosure and it's actually perfect for one. And I recommend putting these in shoebox enclosures because uh, it holds the humidity very well in the species. Like I haven't missed this one for over two weeks and I still have plenty of uh, wet substrate in there. And all you need is just add a cave for her to hide and that's pretty much it. Okay, for now the Platyama, I'll show you uh, the male, then I'll show you what the female looks like. Well, if I could just get him out. All right, so here, here's what she looks like. He looks like this is Nicola. Uh, this is my five and a half inch immature male, P. platyama. As you can notice, uh, let me get the flashlight. He has a lot of pink on him. This is why they call it the pink bloom bird eater. So hopefully next molt he's going to mature and hopefully I'll pair them up with that big old mature female which we'll see very soon. So let me get open up the cage. All right, I have a little bit of a cold, so you have to excuse me here. And this is my at least nine-inch uh, Pompavius platyama. You could definitely note the color differences between the mature male and the mature female. Alright, now I'll describe the temperament of these species. So, as you may have known, uh, Pomphibidia species are New World terrestrials that come from South America, like countries such as Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil. So, uh, there's, there's a couple of things why I don't recommend handling them. One, just because of their sheer size. As you may have heard earlier in the video, they have a body weight of four ounces especially if it's a gravid female so if you do handle it and somehow manage to drop it from too small of a distance it can actually uh, rupture the abdomen and kill the spider but their temperament as far as they're concerned they're semi-aggressive some of them actually won't hesitate to go into a threat posture before uh, kicking a lot of urticating hairs. These are possibly one of the worst urticating hairs that I've dealt with, but not as bad as the Theraphosa hairs or the Nandu hairs. I react most strongly to the Nandu hairs. Every time I open my Colorado Velosis cage, I get like redness all over my body. That's how uh, strong, as a sense of I react to them. Uh, but they're semi-aggressive, so it's best not to handle them and just leave them in the cage and just monitor them and view for their beauty. <clears throat> so breeding is uh, fairly easy a species to breed. Uh, as I saw from one of the sites that I saw on <clears throat> the internet, 
uh, they are saying that uh, they're pretty much like T. Blondie, the ma female is e very easy going with the male, so I guess that's a good sign. So the eggs are probably not the greatest, so they typically average about 80 eggs on average, and then you can get as high as 280. For overall recommendations, it's a great intermediate spider. Uh, I don't recommend them for beginners just because they're a little tough to care for as spiderlings, but these are good for people who want to try to want to keep a little more aggressive spider and not necessarily want to uh, deal with Lassidora parahibana. So it's a great spider to own. So I want to thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for the P. Metallica Mistbutter video.